Good evening all. Thank you for making the effort to be here. I know it's a very good time in a student's life and a good appearing. The professionals haven't quite got wind of this event or had better or more other uh, pressing engagements. I do know that there is a concert on the campus and that uh, although it doesn't quite coincide with this, it's possibly people putting on their glad rags and preparing for the occasion. It is common in a bit of honor, so the uh, stiff competition for philosophers, I would guess. <laughs> um, you may or may not have attended the previous, uh, have, how many here have attended of the previous sessions last year? No. You do know they're available on YouTube when your board moments, when you have about three hours to spare, and you can download or watch in sessions of 20 minutes each, each of the presentation. You'll see that the uh, sponsors who are both of them and partners have graciously arranged that the occasion be documented. So it is actually out there in virtual reality. Should you wish to engage in previous discussions where we had at least Two, and I think we had one more, and that was Professor Dani Hwerson, who we had presented as well. He's not available tonight. Uh, was, was there another in the previous series? I don't think there was just three. So we had at least have two of the three back with us. Um, Professor Adams Wolf, as in the meantime, he was heading to Frankfurt on, uh, was it von Hugo? Yes. Really prestigious grant um, to to Germany. We just uh, before his presentation. He's back with us. That shows you how quickly time passes. So take note, you're young, but he won't be here forever. Hence, he will be here much older sooner than you think. <laughs> um, thanks again to the group for the making the arrangements and at least getting some help. And then, uh, yeah, this is a, a, a forum for a, well, we're going to call it a conversation rather than a debate because the number is present, and uh, a, a more intimate audience than we've had before. And uh, you've seen the title of the series, Setting an Agenda for the Discipline, the discipline, of course, being architecture for the future, for the future being what's left of the 21st century, which is essentially you people should occupy for most of your lives. I think many of you can make the next one, but some may have got. But um, it's topical for you, and uh, I think what we're going to ask is each of the panelists to introduce themselves, and then perhaps we can uh, make a positive question. May they be they wish to a positive question? I could posit a question we can debate as to how we set this thing in motion. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for coming. So, can you make no, a I'm Hans Wolf. I'm actually uh, teaching philosophy. Uh, I think my biggest claim to fame here is that uh, I come from a family with a lot of architects in <laughs> it. <laughs> so I um, presented that year a paper a year ago uh, in which I tried to describe uh, architectural practice as a uh, practice of intervention in the ongoing processes of habitation of uh, common uh, UTPs. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Mervo. Um, I'm teaching uh, in the School of Architecture and Planning at Fitz University. And, um, I'm currently running the design thesis, but uh, it's largely a coordination of role that task because uh, one of the schools involved in one way or another. And I'm also teaching history and theory in, in the school, which is my primary interest. And uh, last year I presented a um, lecture based on one of my own lectures for my students on historicism, and I, I tried to present a fairly constructionist notion of history, and um, I hope to show that there were some very uh, interesting questions that poses for architecture, 
and the way we work with it. Anyway, I'm sure we might get to that. <laughs> Perhaps. Talk to the beach, You'll take it to me. <coughs> Good evening. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jean-Pierre Delaporte. I'm the research director for the Institute for Advanced Studies in Architecture and Infrastructure, which is an advisory body to government and private sector throughout SEDEC. Uh, my academic affiliation is to this university, where I've taught uh, elective courses for the last uh, 10 years. Um, and I've just come back from co-curating the South African uh, Pavilion at the uh, Venice Biennale with my colleague, uh, Lynn Kahn. Uh, I'm fairly new to this debate in that uh, I followed last year's uh, proceedings, but at a distance. Uh, and so I, I hope that the questions raised won't be too difficult ones, Roger. Good evening, I'm Clark. I'm a practicing architect and urban designer. I'm based here in Pretoria, where I have my own small form. I'm also part-time affiliated with the Department of Architecture here, where I currently teach in the Honours Studio, and I also teach a theory course in the fifth quarter that deals with theories of place. Um, my interest as an urban designer and urban architect comes from looking very deeply at context and landscape, and my approach to architecture is also formulated from that, and I hope I can contribute from that viewpoint to the debate. Okay, now um, we can do this democratically and the audience can set it off the debate. Any of you have a burning question you'd like to pose to the panelists in that we can start a discussion? If not, I'm going to have to be creative. <laughs> Is there anybody in the audience who... Inquisitive. <coughs> you can I ask a question? Yeah, of course, yes. Uh, just, just an introduction. Can you just elaborate a little bit on the Venice Biennale um, in terms of uh, is it you're representing South Africa officially at the Biennale and how did it fit in briefly with the theme of the Biennale or not Africa? The theme of Rome Kulos, the curate for right. Yes, it is the uh, South African National Pavilion um, uh, commissioned by the Department of Arts and Culture uh, in national government and uh, commissioned approximately by the South African Commissioner General, which is the usual way of doing these things, very formal. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the Kohlhaas theme was split in two. On the one hand, he wanted to interrogate modernity as an episode and a resource uh, within architecture and his own uh, exhibition. And others uh, went to that, and on the other hand, his brief to the National Pavilions was to say, talk to the experience with modernity in each particular country. And uh, since we were coming in as one of the 40 national pavilions, uh, that's what uh, we focused on. <clears throat> and we focused on modernity in a, in a very simple way. We said that there had been uh, two exponents of modernity in uh, 20th century South African experience. The one was through an incredible uh, project of social engineering through, um, through the arising of the Afrikaner republics and going through a cultural reformulation, a national reformulation, and then a state reformulation, ending in, in 94. And on the other hand, a tremendous experience with political modernity, the idea of a, of a political diaspora, which came upon black South African leadership in uh, 1913 after the Land Act. And <clears throat> after realizing that one could not petition the, the British king, the British uh, colonial power for rights, simply adopted a very visionary American idea of a pan-African nationalism from such sources as Dubai and, and uh, Darwin. And we traced the, how the two modernist ideas of a social engineering of, an, of, a, of a fantastic environmental resource, a designed environmental resource on the white side, and the idea of a, of a, uh, of a nationalism uh, as a unifying idea in a diaspora. Uh, were the two expressions of modernity that ran parallel and then uh, flowed together in 94. So that was, in a nutshell, uh, what, what happened in, and it's still, going, still happening in that. We had two months to do it <laughs> from start to finish, worked 14 hour days, based everything purely on documentary uh, evidence, put 350 square meters of uh, exhibition together. 
uh, and almost uh, killed ourselves, but it seems to have touched a few uh, sympathetic notes with the Italians. Uh, next month we have the University of Bologna and the Architecture School of Venice and the editorial board of Dermis magazine coming out for a workshop uh, with us as part of the sequel to, to that discussion. So there was some resonance of the staff and experience of the Dermis Thank you. Welcome. Right. Uh, um, is there anybody in the audience who wants to uh, talk or question? To the issue, must I try and get the panelists going? Do you prefer me to try and get the panelists going? <laughs> All right, um, perhaps uh, the questions has an agenda for the discipline in the 21st century not already been set, perhaps? Things like the climate change summits, these uh, earth summits that we have every so often. Uh, perhaps even through episodes like these uh, Arab Springs, uh, are they peripheral to the issues? Are there other issues that uh, we are missing, that uh, are more covert perhaps, that are sneaking up on us and, uh, from a philosophical point of view, from a way we are in the world point of view, and where we think about where we are and how they Discipline perhaps should react to that? Is there a revolution brewing that we haven't quite put our finger on? Or are we in the revolution? And then, do we have any episodes from the past where one can say there are moments where that the discipline can identify which are equivalent, possibly different, where agendas have been set and responded to and perhaps we have, in a way, we are in the death phases of those responses and maybe our uh, preoccupations are still addressing past agendas which are in the process of expiring. Um, do those sound like good points for launching a discussion? Is there anybody who would like to respond? If you'd like to uh, just say the first thing that uh, interesting to my mind, the first concern would be to uh, state very clearly who is doing what for whom when you speak about setting an agenda. Mm. It's one thing to say, let's set an agenda for architecture, but what are you actually uh, meaning? Yeah. Are you meaning uh, we have to reflect about the way in which uh, students will be taught in the School of Architecture? Or are you thinking of the way in which uh, South African uh, architects as a uh, professional fraternity should think about its position within uh, social questions like social justice and so on and so forth? So I think that would be uh, for me the first question of clarification so that we don't mix uh, questions that are, issues. that are entirely, uh, entirely different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can. Uh, I fully agree about the importance of the matters that you uh, raise there, but um, if you think that uh, you have to do the uh, training of architects and you want to think at least of something like an agenda for the next five years or the first five years of the career of a young architect, you certainly are not going to uh, uh, be too demanding when it comes to something like global warming. <laughs> you have to break that down to the level on which uh, a young architect can, uh, can have an influence, mm -hmm. right? Lest we uh, uh, speak in the air and have beautiful ideas amongst uh, well, what, the, what, what, what you to, uh, uh, predominant student audience, what would you like to hear discuss? Your future in a profession or you at the tail end of your education, so whatever we decide about education, what can affect you? Or am I wrong? Yes. Firstly, we're interested in the agenda for the discipline as such architecture globally, I guess, um, because I guess that's where our biggest challenge lies with what the role of architecture in human in the human condition. You want the big picture? The big discussion. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's relevant to everybody. Yeah. 
In that case, I would just like to point to an important uh, uh, issue that you implicitly raise, and it's a question. What is the relation between something like an agenda that you could set for uh, architecture as a profession, even globally, you said globally, and the fact that the profession obviously doesn't do anything. There are only architects working in the offices, some very small, some big. But you have to at least thematize this question, lest you end up with something like, I don't know what you call it, the world body of uh, professional architects or whatever. You like, do, I, I have uh, uh, just had the Congress down in Durban. Voila, yes. this kind of thing, uh, writing uh, beautiful uh, press uh, statements and so on and so forth, meaning absolutely nothing in practice. Right, so at least you have to thematize that in, in one way or another. Okay. Do you have any takes on the matter, John? You know, I would hope there's some relationship between teaching and practice. And I suppose I'm saying that because if I'm anything, I'm, I, I hope I'm an educator. I try to do that. <laughs> I take that very uh, seriously. I love teaching. I really, really do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in, I, when I used to teach first year design, day one, I used, to, I used to tell my students that I think you already know a lot about architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to help you to become conscious of what you already know. And I always used to tell my students I, I actually feel privileged to stand here in front of you because you're the new generation. And I'm going to learn a lot from you. And um, I don't. As a teacher, in that sense, I don't put an agenda on the table for my students. As, as, in the sense of that I conceive it as an ideology or a coherent set of ideas that I put on the table. I engage them in conversation, and I, I, I do put things on the table from my own experience and from my own interests. We, 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 we talk about them, of course. Mm -hmm. but I'm, you know, I just think that uh, when you go out into the world and, it's, it's the, and you act and you create and you make, it's a very open game. You can do it in this way, you can do it in that way. And I'm not a great believer in narrow agendas. I think they, I'm not so sure they, I, I don't know, I don't know. I'm just not a, a, a big one for that. And I, I, I hope that in the time I have with my students, I learn to think, be creative, be active. And um, I think those things are good. Those things are really good. And when the challenges come, and they, they certainly will, I think the, gen the new generation is going to know what to do. Mm -hmm. And it's not a very good answer, I admit, but it's more or less my approach to education. <laughs> It's, I feel it's what I can give to the practice of our Alright, thanks for that. Jean-Paul? Jean-Pierre? So Jean-Paul is the Pope. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jean the Pope is Jean-Pierre. <laughs> well, I, I think that <clears throat> architecture always has an agenda imposed on it. And I think part of Roger's question, part of the concept, is how one can find elbow within the agendas that are imposed on architects, by developers, uh, by the state need um, for architectural services, uh, for housing, to address urbanization, sustainability, etc. By the debates which are currently uh, raging around, uh, obviously, our need to take some kind of managerial stance towards nature. Um, <clears throat> and architects are expected to be cognizant of that in, in different ways and play a role in that. And of course, by the political issues, which in this country are the burning issues of poverty and inequality, I think would remain those issues for a long time. So when architects ask, what is my relevance, or what is the relevance of what I'm learning, they tend to want to answer, or, or, or find an answer, uh, through this range of questions. But then, of course, there is the danger of engaging with those questions and becoming more and more expert in those questions in your capacity as a citizen immersing yourself in the books, the discussions, the media, the debates uh, on those issues, and then finding yourself divided from your expertise and the kind of role and opportunity that is given to you by society.
to practice a very specific kind of expertise as an architect. Then, while practicing that expertise, you find yourself further disintermediated from expertise by the engineers, the project managers, the developers, the financiers, uh, the who knows whom, um, who, who bring a very high-powered technique and a huge clarity to bear on the, on the kind of projects you're involved in, the kind of work you do. So you, you find yourself becoming a policy exponent within the professional team, trying to give some kind of heart or perspective or some kind of moral weight uh, to a project, uh, only to be marginalized within that team. And on the other hand, you find yourself invited to sort of forums like this, where architecture is supposed to speak for specialization in general and have some kind of authoritative position on, on issues which are, are of concern to citizens, such as global warming, the Arab Spring, uh, <clears throat> anything which you, you feel is important to architecture's relevance. So I'm saying that you're more or less stuck and that you need a high degree of agility to function between these two roles and uh, not disappear in the cracks. So I, I would say that. That's the general setting. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to start with something that I'm thinking about in the darker moments of the night. And one thing that's I'm mean, likely very bothered by in architecture is how much should we actually be building? How much should we be developing in terms of where we are environmentally on this planet? And how much impact that we're doing is having on the planet? Um, and in some sense, the best thing we can be doing is to actually be doing less of what we are good at doing, which is designing and build us. I think we all as architects need to ask ourselves, and, and I think as a larger society and as an economy, it's always pushing growth, development, expansion. Is this something we should still be doing to the extent that we're doing it? Because it's not sustainable to keep on doing this. And I think as our young architects who are being educated, we, that is something I think we need to ask ourselves, and are we learning and as educated how we're teaching students. And it's something that we all, we all talk about sustainability in our buildings. We talk about, you know, zero carbon cities like Maslow, which is not really that. And I think we really need to consider, is that something that we should be interrogating in terms of how glibly we talk about being sustainable in our profession, which is one of the great agendas of architecture right now. Secondly, I want to latch on to something that John Pierce but about in South Africa itself. And this is something that I find in practice in some sense more and more concerning is we, are, we have to do a great many things to change society as it is. Yet the country, and I think the architectural profession itself, is very much stuck in the technical and legal and, 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 and implementational systems of a previous government. And the new government has adopted, in some sense, it brilliantly. And I think that has an impact on the profession itself. On, urban planning and development, and on social development, and economic development, where we're extremely conservative and we're very much regulated, even though the place where our society is at at the moment cannot really function within those incredibly strong constraints and increasing conservatism. And I think as a profession, we actually we did it almost the exact opposite. We architects aren't practicing in many of the fields where we need to be practicing. Formal settlement upgrades is one area of focus where I think like Combrick is working on. Yet we are not welcome in those professions and it's in those areas, and it's very difficult for us to enter those. So, so I think we need some flexibility in a society that's actually still very much caught in, a, in, a, in an incredibly strict structure that was set by the previous regime. How do we break out of it? I think our profession in that sense is extremely conservative and we're bound by. Societal, societal rules, regulations, laws that still comes from a previous system. How do we break out of that? I think the profession really needs to, need to look towards that to set an agenda and then and get towards the larger environmental issues as well. Okay. So anything that any of the panelists have said that other, another panelist would like to respond to, elaborate on, continue, theme, change direction? Well, it seems to me uh, um, quite evident then uh, that if we uh, take up your, your call to reflect on gender, that we are uh, not only clear about the level at which we are speaking, or if we are speaking about practice teaching, but that we are entirely clear about
about the specific way in which um, architects, students, uh, lecturers and so on are bound up in, in uh, s uh, social practices, institutions and so on, as I think all three of my colleagues have, uh, have hinted at. Lest you sit in a, a writing agenda that's beautiful, that has a solution to everything from a global warming to the Arab Spring, but cannot be translated into practice. Because if you say, set an agenda, you say, let us think about things that we can do. It's a nice to have a vision and a mission and, and all of that. Oh, yeah. it's, uh, it looks nice on paper and so on. But if you are not capable of translating that in one way or another to the kind of thing that real human beings can do under the extremely difficult practical constraints with which people are confronted, then it is hard to end. Mm -hmm. Does it mean wasting our time, or does it mean, are we over ambitious? Or no, I, say, um, I don't say that there's, there's no sense in having such a discussion. I say, let's just be very clear about what the limits are um, and what we can do. Okay. Um, if we were to reflect on it, I did ask it as a question, but has it ever been done before in, for the discipline? Is the, modern, is the modern project an agenda that architects set for themselves and responded to and are still responding to? Or is that just the way we privilege ourselves with a particular understanding, this enamored, enamorment we have of the modern movement which we have you know, the, as a, a trajectory in the discipline which has operated for the last century? I think this is an interesting question. Um, because, um, and it, it, it's related to another question, which might sound like an odd question, but I think it's quite a profound question. Should architecture have an agenda of its own? Mm. I, mean, that, I mean, it seems to me that's a very important question to ask. I mean, we often assume that, but is that the case? In, in my own thinking, I think that at any one time there's always very pressing and important issues. Obviously, environmental uh, concerns are exceedingly um, pressing. We don't need to voice that, it's obvious, we, we know that. Um, and, but, these, but these sorts of issues are, of course, concerns for everyone. Mm. So in that sense, they're public or they're common, they're general concerns. And architecture has a role to play within those concerns. But those concerns, do they then translate into specific concerns that you can say are architectural concerns? That's, that's, the, that's the question. I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question. But I can say, as a person who's interested in architectural history, I do think the notion that architecture picks up a social project that it defines for itself is deeply embedded in modernism and a whole series of imaginations that modernism releases sets into circulation. And I think we're still uh, thinking about that. Um, the question is, should architecture have its own unique project, or should the project be, be one that is derived from a, a, a wider, more public-oriented discussion? I have to say my feelings are more on the, on the latter. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've seen is, a, is, is the realization it, we, I think we move from the notion of a distinctly architectural project onto a wider framing of that notion. Which is not to say there aren't things that architecture can contribute. Mm -hmm. Obviously there are. I know that, that would be my, hmm. my first thought. On that. But I do think that what's almost missing, and that comes from the whole modern project, is the sort of the visionary, utopian approach to things. We, people felt through architecture they could change things. And in some sense, and I find it sometimes in students, I wish I could see more kind of revolutionary approaches, you know, not only in terms of architecture, but also in terms of social agendas, which I think were set in the beginning of the century, the 60s, definitely. And that's some, something that seems to be lacking. And in some sense, I think we need to use that to reinvigorate the debate. Because I think in some sense, it's almost like, We've lost the enthusiasm to do, and I think we need that. 
I think to deal with our problems both locally and globally, we do need to, to do that. And I, but I do think, as Jonathan said, there should be a relation to larger societal issues where we do need to somewhat redefine the profession and adapt, because I think we have become a little bit too isolated in terms of how we practice, which in some sense we need to do in able to be able to practice in a very complex world. On the other hand, we do need to you know, diversify as well, so it, it's a difficult thing to do. Okay. <clears throat> no, I think the question has to arise as to whether what we teach is a form of reliable knowledge, whether there is some autonomous body of knowledge which uh, architectural research, architectural practice, architectural curricula, which assembles all the norms of that knowledge, in some sense takes forward and, and takes forward by, by reference to itself. Do we have criteria for judging what we do as architecture? as good or bad or relevant before it finds itself qualified that way in the context. What struck me um, uh, uh, I'm being forced to reflect in this panic stricken way <laughs> quickly and take something uh, representative of South African experience to the Gatsby and Island. Um, something that would interest a general architectural community around the world interested in modernism is the way in which um, the Africada experience, uh, which was an experience of unprecedented social engineering in order to get into a post-colonial frame, in order to get away from the British colonial uh, influence, um, <clears throat> in fact embraced not only modernism, but before it embraced modernism and almost perfected uh, modernism within a social engineering context and a spatial planning, it, in, it ran through a whole number of extraordinary uh, eclectic regional uh, historicists and other alternatives. If one looks at one individual figure, a humongous, towering figure, uh, uh, Murder, for instance, uh, and you just look at what his contribution was. This student of the AA in London comes back and suddenly starts ransacking everything to create this maximum distance through design, through the built environment. Uh, from the British colonial public presence and tries to create and project another public realm. Now, there's never been an experience like that in any post-colonial context anywhere in the world. And when I speak to <clears throat> Afrikaans language campuses and I say that you have an extraordinary uh, inheritance of indigenization, all Afrikaans institutions are post-colonial projects. They're trying to simply take the oxygen out of the British colonial atmosphere and by indigenizing it, make it specific to South Africa. Yes, it's done in a very bizarre way with some very bizarre consequences, but it is a genuine indigenization. Um, you know, it would be an ad hoc argument to say that because it was done for certain purposes that, that it was not genuine. I mean, and one is, is, is sitting on a social engineering project that was formulated in terms of built environment and came to be perfected in terms of modernism and modernity. So there's seldom been a laboratory on this scale, say the city of Pretoria or, or even the uh, homelands uh, project and so on, where spatial planning and, and the social engineering through design have been so closely and intensely and, and successfully linked. Um, <clears throat> so that is a legacy which needs to be interrogated and understood and which people should not be ashamed of uh, in these universities. It was the work of your grandfathers, grandmothers, and fathers and mothers, essentially. And it needs to be basically brought into the present. Uh, so if you feel like taking a genealogical perspective on that, or a Hegelian perspective on that, to say what was implicit in that practice that your generation can make explicit for, for an architecture now, you will find yourself in this country having gone further into the modernist project than anyone else in the world, because in this country the modernist project could roll out without restriction, because it rolled out in an atmosphere without rights. So it could go to the end of its process. So there is something which is already an agenda. You don't have to look elsewhere for an agenda. You're in a wonderful position to interrogate the modern uh, uh, experience. In, in terms of your own legacy, which you are and unfortunately seem a little alienated from. But I think it's a brilliant legacy, fantastic story. Subject to the usual qualifications. Yes, it can take much evil. <laughs> <But> <laughs> <laughs>
How, how does one exercise the evil and rescue the, uh, what one could, uh, given it a, a, a certain, what would one say, uh, nobility? Can it be, can that one exercise the evil and rescue the nobility of that particular episode? I don't want to talk too much here. <laughs> I'm the only person who wasn't here last year. Now I'm like kind of to having, to, having to really improvise it's to, it's to, to sum up what I'm sure were brilliant contributions <laughs> by my colleagues. And, and just an interesting thought. Well, look, I suppose okay. having put that cat out the bag, mm -hmm. the situation is not that dissimilar to post Maoist uh, China. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not dissimilar to uh, post war Germany. It's not dissimilar to um, post Stalinist Russia. Uh, or even to post Roosevelt or post New Deal America, because those are all other examples of social engineering where people set out to use certain principles to design and create a certain kind of society, or create an environment in which a certain kind of thinking comes about. Instead of saying, I'll change what is in your head, I'll change what your head is in, and therefore you will, you will become a certain kind of creature. Now that is a design-led uh, revolution. And Henry Favut stands with Stalin, stands with uh, Hitler, stands with Roosevelt um, as one of the great social engineers. Uh, so one should be clear as to what that experience is. Now, of course, all those countries had to carefully dissociate themselves from the past, but there could be no blanket rejection of the past because, of course, one's living on top of the past. And in, in, in this country, this huge infrastructural legacy becomes a confluence with the huge political and nation-building legacy of the African National Congress, which is absolutely experimentalized ideas from the, the American uh, um, uh, African diaspora, you know, and, 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 and took them way beyond what was happening in the American diaspora. The American diaspora attained the level of a civil rights struggle within very American constitutional terms, but in South Africa, the ideas of African nationalism went way beyond anything implemented within the uh, diaspora. So you've got these two tremendous modernizing traditions <clears throat> that suddenly run together, bang, like nitroglycerin in, in 1994. And yet you all seem uh, fairly uh, unenergized and alienated. <laughs> I think you're sitting on, on, on a world uh, changing, certainly game changing story. And it certainly involves architecture, and it certainly involves the control of public space from, from the point of view of black like, politics the politics of presence uh, on the one hand and on the other hand, pushing modernism to its extreme to create a new type of being, a new type of westernness. Uh, on, on, on the case of, of, of the white uh, story, I think these are two spectacular stories if we can just not be uh, hung up too much on moralistic criticism. It's like Leni Riefenstahl, uh, a fantastic filmmaker, who recreates the documentary on a level never before imagined. Absolute Nazi, and all paid for by Hitler. What are we going to do? Burn that? <laughs> you know, you have to t take a very fine line, and I'm sure Ansco will, will, you know, be keen to speak to this. One has to take a very fine line because you're dealing with something which is politically radioactive, but it is also an important <coughs> thing. Now, you could deal with it like Homer Simpson, he deals with radioactive things every day, I see. Uh, or, or you could simply reject it. Uh, you could try and carve off the good parts and the bad parts. You know? So you've got Plato's problem. How do you carve this problem at the joints? And where are the joints? And are there joints? Uh, but you have to engage with it. And I think that you, as custodians of a, of a continuous tradition of built environment, or let's say of, of progress through design, or of utopian thinking through design, you as a direct inheritor of in a good position to engage with, but then you should start setting agendas and principles for treating it, whether you treat it genealogically or you treat it practically. Really, I don't know. But uh, it strikes me that it's there. Um, and it's something I learned about really teaching in this university over 10 years, because I started to wonder why is this university so darn good? <laughs> and you know, the next very darn good one is Bloemfontein, which I also have some dealings with. And then I'm saying that from there on it's all downhill in terms of architecture schools. <laughs> <laughs>
Who do you want to respond first, John? Because John is my dear friend. I don't want to to steal it. I don't want to make any ad hominem speculations as to why it's all down here. I thought, why is there this extraordinary momentum, this extraordinary head of steam uh, in in Africana uh, history uh, for both design and for media? You know, you could kindle the whole of creative industries out of SABC. And you could kindle the whole of, of, of an incredible design culture out of, uh, out of these uh, schools. And why is it so good? Why is there such confidence? Why is it such a beautiful campus, etc.? It's a commitment to something. And we need to understand that something you know, in, in all its dimensions. It's, it's a powerful piece of social engineering based on faith in modernism. Um, do you based on what Jean-Pierre has just said. I think we can say that projects are quite complicated things. When we read them through their intentions, they seem ideologically clear. And of course, they're aligned to very clear ideological agendas. They have no. Sometimes they can be deeply embedded in disturbing histories. And we're absolutely right to judge those histories. Don't get me wrong. Um, but they can have unforeseen con consequences because architecture is material, it's infrastructural, and it can be appropriated. And it's constantly being appropriated and reappropriated and counter appropriated. And those appropriations can never be conceived by those who engineer the agenda at the start. I think this is one of the things we've learned in historical studies that we can come in on these different registers. And we can read and count and read buildings in, in, these, in these, these various ways. I mean, some of the most, uh, there were all those very interesting studies um, uh, coming in which looked at how missionaries um, converted people, uh, the people that were converted hybridized and changed, inserted their own histories in that mythology, shifted it, and used appropriated ideas in the dominant culture, and then used it to get back at power by holding their holding power accountable to its own supposed principles, which it didn't wasn't, you know, honest about. So I don't know, projects for me are very complicated things. And they're very solid, but they're also fragile in another way. And uh, you can you can, they don't trap you. You can, you can counter maneuver within them. For, and for me, as a historian, that's a very interesting thing. And I, think, and I don't think I'm talking theory. Well, I am, but I'm not. Mm. I think if you look at historical um, record, you can see these counter movements. Thank goodness for that. Mm. And still, mm -hmm. to. I just, you know, it's interesting that, you know, but I do think we are in some sense, the new dispensation has actually adopted a lot of those principles and we are still replicating a lot of the good but also a lot of the bad agendas that were built in just because they're caught in this structure. Maybe ideologically that's not what people want to do, but I think spatially we are repeating these experiments and, and, and actually exacerbating the effects definitely on the structure of our cities, um, architecturally to some extent. But I think I think that is a problem. And I, John Pierre was not interrogating this modernist agenda. I think it has evolved to a point where it's becoming, instead of transforming society, which it needs, so I think it, it, it's dropping it. Mm -hmm. It, it, in those battles of the past, because we can't break out of all these kind of institutions and laws and regulations that we've set down in order to put them in place in the first. You know, I, I think, and I think that I think it's not the intention of the society as it is now to keep on repeating these patterns. But I think we're doing it because we're caught within the system, and maybe that's why when we're setting a new agenda. We should be aware that we're at. Mm -hmm. Interesting observation. And. This is a very uh, uh, complex issue, excuse me. Um, I uh, have to think very carefully in formulating my opinion since the way in which we use the term modernity in philosophy is not the same as in, as in uh, architecture. Well, adapt my, 
my point of view, in such a way to make it compatible with what has been said. It uh, seems to me uh, quite clear that, um, on the one hand, one has to conceive of uh, anything that you may remotely call the agenda for architecture. That means on a, on a bigger scale, practice of country, globally, in relation to existing political forces. The second thing is that the uh, movements that uh, Jean-Pierre has uh, described, they were modernist in the, in the pure sense of the word. We uh, tend to um, be very careful about modernist projects uh, since uh, at the very latest, the 60s and 70s, because of the specific kind of political projects associated with it. These are typically uh, political projects in which people set up themselves as master constructors of a new society. They are projects, as has been quite correctly said, like that of apartheid, I think so. An excellent uh, example. The reason why people tend to be uh, very wary of such projects, or to say it in a different way, wary of such big and ambitious ad agendas, is exactly because we have so many lessons from the past today of how things can go wrong. Now, some people would say that, well, the problem with modernist projects like uh, communism or fascism or the like it's just that um, those people who tried it out they missed it up they had the opportunity and they just didn't do it well but there's such a big series of those experiences that um, people nowadays tend to think that there's a problem with setting agendas making projects in that way Chances are very good that if you are going to think about matters political in that way, you are going to mess up on a spectacular scale. Right. If we think about something like an agenda for architecture, and if we have to think about that agenda in linking the architectural profession to project or agenda set in the political sphere, then I think the first word is a word of caution. Be careful with whom you link yourself. The example of, um, of indigenization in South Africa is a, a very good example. What seems to be at first a counter modern movement, or counter-modern gesture, namely embracing of the particular and the local, turns out to be the very impetus, starting point from which the very negative things, the very negative possibilities in to modernity can be remobilized again. It's the same story the actors have changed, right, to, to say it uh, in a very uh, and I want to draw another um, implication from all of this. Let's suppose that uh, Jean-Pierre is uh, right in saying that you could uh, schematize South African uh, history as a, of the 20th century at least by placing next to each other two uh, modern projects. Then. I think the very intriguing thing that we have to establish to see where we are as architects and common citizens is where are those two projects? Two modest projects that collide. Do they give peaceful rainbow nation with no history of no development of no energy left of anything of that? Is that a plausible uh, vision of uh, our contemporary history or our recent history? Or should we not rather uh, consider the possibility 
of the history of the last 20, 30 years being indeed something like a confrontation of different worlds, of different projects, but in which the mixture that comes from that confrontation is still underway. I, for one, do not think that the revolution is over or that the, the change in South Africa started. Thank you very much, Mandela's president. It's all over. Let's start. I don't buy that story. I think it's continually progressing. People are continually exploring this something that came about in this uh, enormous uh, struggle, and we are still trying to discover what it is that we are dealing with, at least in our social political reality. If that is the case, then I think we should come back to the first thing that John Pierre said. Start by documenting very carefully the way in which we relate to politics, to the economy, to, uh, to those who initiate projects, and so on and so forth. Because if we don't, we will fail to see the ways in which the changing social political circumstances already represent the matrix from which the new criteria for excellence of profession emerges. What happens in a melting pot like we have in South Africa is that people, individuals, organizations, parties, groupings, constantly enter into dispute and negotiation with each other on that which is precious to them. Let us call it the values. What do we mean by something like freedom or liberty? What do we mean by something like indigenization? What do we mean by something like uh, uh, integration or equality? Those are not questions that can be tackled by architects alone, but we obviously can have no architectural profession if we do not orientate ourselves with respect to the ongoing debates and struggles about what those things are. Right, I could uh, go on that perhaps. Yeah, that's fair, fair reflection, fair comment, because I suppose that you might say we'll add to that spectrum and what is architecture, and particularly what should it be. Mariana said, have we built too much, perhaps in a world of resource exploitation or where we try to minimize or trying to minimize exploitation of resources, perhaps our profession needs to stand back a bit from what it does best. I don't know if that was a fair uh, understanding of what you were saying. It's, it's, it's something I think we need to think of. Yes. I mean, so, in some sense we're not destroying ourselves but we are limiting ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, and it should be. Mm -hmm. you know, should we find? I think we are talking about finding other ways, but you know, it seems always to be through production. Should we be doing that? Mm -hmm. And I always thought architects could do that. Mm -hmm. Can they be architects without production? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> are we a dying profession? Yes. Do you, um, um, this thing of the project. Uh, 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 Notion of Granite Project. Um, my friend Jean Pierre teases me. He says, I've got this sexy idea of history with a little edge. So he told me that my theory with a little T. And I guess there has to be a project with a little P. He says, it's a sexy idea. <laughs> 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 Which I, I, I have to say, I never thought it in those terms. <laughs> quite, quite entertaining. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of us do approach of a, a truly grand project with a degree of skepticism. Yeah. Maybe it's a lack of confidence we have in our time. I don't know. I can't give you the, the reasons for that. Um, but that doesn't top you having projects. And they're, they're everywhere. And they make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I mean, architecture is always embedded in a series of projects. And I think they're very particular. And you know what? As an architect, we can really do good things. Well, we can do good things as a human being. Mm -hmm. It's just an extension of that. And I think you can, I, uh, I, I, I'm 
very keen to find the particularity of this approach. If you can find it, and, and you can extract from it something of meaning and of purpose, you know? I think that's, for me, that's, that's what the architect can do. I think it's often very particular from my own perspective. Which, which doesn't mean there aren't wider agendas and bigger issues. And they may be all involved in that because we're inside society. And they, they constrict and they, they give guidance and we, we contribute to those, those projects. And there, there, are, there are big projects. They're out there. And even if I don't want them to be there, they're there anyway. Because, because you can't escape them. We are in an era where people plan and think and, and, and represent and, and make. And we, in that sense, we don't escape the big project of modernity. Because modernity precisely gives us the tools to imagine, to think, to orchestrate, to create the big project. It's kind of like one of the things that's embedded in our knowledge. We can produce these things. A lot of us are nervous about them because we've seen bad consequences from them in our recent past. Um, so I don't know if that makes any sense, but I, I, there, there, there must be a conversation between the projects that are architectural. For me, they're more located. And bigger social agendas and questions and issues. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay, what, so I, I did want to pose one question. The one, one place that still seems to believe in the big project is China and Southeast Asia. And I'm, why are they still doing it with so much confidence where the rest of us are very cautious about? I don't know if anybody has ideas on that. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a conversation stop. <laughs> 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 but, but I mean, they're still going on in specific areas. Mario is absolutely correct in that observation. It's puzzling. I, I was quite amused and also very intrigued to read a Chinese um, theorist of the free market, who said that it's the function of the Communist Party, which rules China, as you know, and makes all administrative and financial decisions, to make sure that the free market works according to absolutely pure principles. So now you have a Communist Party administering the legacy of Ayn Rand and Hayek in order to make sure that, the, that, that there is no deviation from the absolute purity of the free market, so it becomes a better and better instrument for minimizing risk and allocating resources. So the Communist Party has become the fox guarding the in-house of, uh, of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And Rand and I find it very interesting that the Communist Party is seeming to do this with enormous success in China, because China is a way an exemplary free market society. I, I am very intrigued by Hans's comments and Jonathan's Moyans and um, on, on scaling the big project that South Africa finds itself in. I think we make a fundamental mistake by thinking we're waiting for a little bus to come along and collect us. We've got rid of the, uh, the grand meta narratives and whatever, and now we have a postmodern modesty and we critique the critiques and we're sitting around waiting for something on an appropriate environment for every scale. I think that would amount to a massive irresponsibility uh, in this country, both as citizens and as professionals and as thinkers, simply because. The capitalist project, which is you know, tongue and saliva with the colonial project, and the modernization project, which is introduced by the two of these things, ran at extraordinary speed in South Africa in the 20th century simply because it was unrestricted and unopposed by rights, as was the case in all colonial contexts. Hence, if there is some kind of dynamic in modernization and capitalism, South Africa is far ahead of the rest of the world because like a jack-in-the-box, this process could unfold without any inertia holding it back. So we have a modernism and a modernist and capitalist vantage point far ahead of any other country in the world. We are in fact the future from one point of view. From the other point of view, the black resistance and the formulation of uh, an identity in a project within a diaspora is in itself a very advanced kind of politics, as we see around the diasporic uh, politics today uh, in Palestine and other places. But it also produced something 
which other places in the world are trying desperately to produce through Arab Springs, Orange Revolutions, uh, uh, occupation movements and so on, and that is civil society. Because black South Africa absolutely lacked access to rights and a state through which to implement them, its vehicle in mobilization was pure civil society, which would get a medal from the Jürgen Habermas. Hence, uh, we have got having experimentalized and projected and created a civil society under unnatural conditions. We've got a very advanced civil society, of which 92% of South African people are custodians. We've got an extraordinarily advanced capitalist and modernist project of which 8% of South Africans are the custodians and understand how the schismo works. Our experiment today, which Anz calls a dangerous melting pot, is that we have suddenly, after having let these things work with, without restraint, we are now introducing a culture of rights in after the fact. Our challenge since 19, 1990 is to simply create a constitutional democracy or create a culture of rights. We're trying to mesh a culture of rights both with black civil society, which has its own institutions, and put a culture of rights, inject carefully a culture of rights into a post-colonial, post and uh, modernistic, a colonial essentially and modernistic process as well, which did so well without rights. Now we have an unfortunate accommodation to rights. It was like the campaign a few years ago, wear a condom. Well, everyone thinks it's a good idea, nobody really wants to wear a condom. We want to shoot miners in Maricada because they're not really South African. We want to do this. We want to always have the exception of flesh to flesh somewhere when it comes to this matter of rights. Because we are trying to dodge rights, because we're in a, in a very synthetic position of not having grown our modernity and civil society from the inaugural event of rights and a representative state. We have now grown those two things outside that atmosphere. And we're trying to impose a representative state and a culture of rights. And that has been the grand experiment since 1990. Now it's a grand experiment in terms of two huge projects which unfolded uh, during that century. So we cannot escape the huge project perspective. However we look at our experience, we simply have to say that we are the heir of a huge project. We've grabbed this hyena by the ears. We don't know how to subdue it and we don't know how to let go. But in any event, the scale of where we engage is actually gigantic. And the vantage point from which we engage is far further down the road than the history of these projects or the manifestation of these projects anywhere else in the world. So unfortunately, it's go big and go. <laughs> well, together a lot of different ideas between making architecture and not making architecture and having a gender being positive about this and so that. And I picked up on sort of a word I guess is that agility. And if we should, as a profession shouldn't pick up onto a sort of agility in the in the sort of modernist framework of our say political structure, something where everything is sort of encapsulated like he's a doctor and an architect. If there is, isn't a chance for architects or the professions in general to sort of exercise more agility in terms of so that the, the solution for architecture might not even lie inside architecture. So, where do you think it would lie at the moment? That, that is, I guess, for the question. Um, but you know, in terms of that, like, I'm, I'm wondering just if we keep looking at the discipline as this as if there's a solution within that, but maybe it lies not within it. There's been a lot of talk about interdisciplinary work. Some of us have tried to be have tried in two disciplines. And it's, you know, I think there is some of it, but the way, and again, it, it comes back to the point, the way the professions are structured and regulated. It's, it's very, it tends to be strict, and, and there's a lot of argument that we have to break out of it to some extent. Because we're dealing again with this whole formal sector and developed economy, and then we're dealing with something completely different that's not regulated. The big part of the country is like that. And for us to have a role in that, the professions, currently we don't. And I think we have to change ourselves in order to move out of the silos of the profession. And there's good reasons why they're so regulated, why the rules are so strict, and why the conventions which we work in are so set, 
in order for the formal sector to function, it has to be that better for the informal one. It's like the wild west. And, and I think bringing those two together in this country is a, it's a big challenge. And for that, I think those architects have to become architects as well. And you know, be guerrillas in some sense, you know, and just like not, not follow the strict rules. Because we are excluded from a lot of activity in all the world's way now. Exactly where we should be going, I'm not sure, but I, I think strictly staying within our professional boundaries is going to make us more and more relevant. But hasn't our exclusion from the same projects like those more things that we don't intervene have been more successful than our own, maybe? Sorry, so can you just put this in the game? I'm not sure. I think. With you saying that we are sort of not engaging in certain, I guess, aspects or we can't get in, in regulatory senses or in impact-wise or sort of things, but those things have maybe sort of been, been way more successful than we actually thought. And I'm particularly thinking about how various architects don't have an influence. I think yes and no. In some cases they have, in some cases I think they can benefit from the particular skill sets we have. Yeah, there, there are, it's interesting because it's the bottom of the human settlements where they do formal upgrades and it's not set openly, but it's said that they don't want architects. They don't want us to say, oh, you're so pretty. I think we can offer something. And, and they have not been successful in, in for instance, you know, how to transform those settlements. So, so there are, but I'm sure there are categories where it's probably benefited from our awareness. So, <laughs> but that idea, I, I think the answer is yes. I'm just thinking of uh, our responsibility to nature and um, how architecture is becoming this artificial product that's just imposed on the landscape, um, whether it's being in the city or not, and how our job as a designer is rather to create, uh, to form part of the link um, in nature than this poison imposed on it and just only producing waste. And in the end, uh, architecture not representing a people or a group of people, a, a client, and that the capitalism ideal forces the subordination um, onto the architect, the subordinate to the client, and that hinders the responsibility we have to rather representing nature, which always has existed. It's just something very silly, but what do you think nature doesn't pay the fees? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're, I mean, I agree with you. It's, it's, but, but, you know, it's, it, once you're in practice, there are certain practicalities that you have to deal with, and making a living is one of them. Um, but, but you're right, I think we have to be more responsive to, to our environment. And the question is, what do we have to do in order to do that? Um, and, and, you know, and I think in terms of that, and I think from your generation, of those questions has to come. You know, it, it, it's, I'm not sure what the answer to this that is, but you know, there, there, there's, a, there's an Australian author called Building, I think it's called The Great Rupture, where it says, well, a lot of us are denying that's going to happen, and, you know, but, but in terms of climate change and the impact we have on our environment, but there's going to be a point where, and he says, we're already there, where we just going to be, have to deal with it. You know, it's not going to be a question of adopting all these measures in terms of climate control we are going to be forced into dealing with the consequences. And I think that's the only thing in the end that's going to make us adapt, because we have to survive. You know, is it the old adapt or die? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which was an interesting thing in the history of South Africa. But you know, it's, it's, you know, we're going to have to evolve, I think, in that sense. And we're not going to have a choice, and that's going to eventually change. Well, why not stop looking towards other people for answers and mm -hmm. looking towards nature for answers? I mean, uh, the revolutionary uh, ideas that have come through biomimicry. Why not impose that on just the perspective change that we as uh, designers should have uh, in order to come up with solutions towards these problems? We need to change our perspectives of creating, creating artificial matter to just, in, no, just working out, integrating this artificial matter in order to yeah, get back to the environment as it should be in the first place. I think something else was also a but I think that's probably the direction we will eventually 
be going, but I just want to say this. It is, I think you're right, but, but again, it's, it's a lot of people work with the very established structures and modes of production and modes of, you know, and, and it's to break out of that. It's very difficult until you're forced to, and I think eventually you'll be forced to, whether it's the GS passing, but I think somebody else should quit that one. But um, <coughs> a breakout opportunity very close to home among your, your close neighbors who are, there's been a generalization of design. You know, a guy like Schlotterdijk says that design is the great notion of the 20th century. It's, it's the key to all the endeavors of the 20th century. In your own country, you try to design uh, your way past politics and history into a spatial dispensation that brings you a lasting peace. I mean, it's the most amazing story. Now, there are other disciplines that, that have embraced design. Cars, for instance, uh, cellular phones, everything in creative industries that develops in intellectual property does so by means of design in some broader sense. Now, where it seems to me that architects, having taught them for many years, um, are strangely insular is that they do not look at themselves among other design disciplines in terms of the case histories and the stories. In other design areas, it costs nearly a billion dollars to establish an innovation in the market before people will buy something like an iPhone and say, this is the way I want to communicate. It's cost nearly a billion dollars to establish something as available as an option. Now, you talk about green architecture or biomimicry and so on. The development cost of a particular biomimicry process before it becomes as commonly available as bricks, mortar, and, and, and steel and glass is very, very high. Now the people who work the most on these developmental costs seem to be every other kind of designer because those designers are highly integrated. They spend thousands of person hours, you know, changing the shape of a bolt on a, on a Toyota, etc. And these things are well documented. We seem to, to as architects, seem to be in a very hit and miss, almost Flintstone type of condition with respect to, with respect to the integration of design. Hence, we, we, we feel so apocalyptic because we don't understand the cost of innovation. If we understood the cost of innovation and how, how design works in the value chain, we might get less rough, roughed up in, in, in other value chains of developers and project managers and so on, where we find ourselves like the small kids. If we became the you know, this phrase, I'd rather rule in hell than, you know, be subordinate in heaven. Uh, so now, where is the hell that architects can rule? It's the hell of design, because <laughs> architects are the great grandmothers and grandfathers. You know, the reserve bank of the design world. When people say designers, architects say, really understand design, applied design. You should move into the creative industries arena, because they have a high integration with both the management of IP and with, with production and with marketing. And there's an understanding of how strategies of innovation, particularly uh, sustainable innovations, can be managed and implemented because it is a management project more than a matter of a good heart. Everyone un understands it has to be done. But how come cell phones are 99% recyclable but buildings are not? We make a loud uh, sound about it because we like to adopt programs, agendas, manifestos, so we, we talk about it. But our implementation of a design strategy or change strategy is very poor. And I think it's because we are so divorced from other design disciplines. We need to actually break into the neighbor's apartment and see how they do things when the new Toyota comes along <laughs> or what uh, you know Samsung is doing to iPhone and so on. We need to be less stubborn with respect to design and uh, learn from its implementation process and try, try and do the same for us and use the need for a sustainable, a sustainable uh, economies as, as our uh, excuse for doing that, as our reason for doing that. it's a lot cleaner than our manufacturing supply, which yeah. <laughs> Which hopefully will change now that we have pretty, you know, I think the level of evolution of new, new material and manufacturing. It's already happening here. Mm. We need to be advocating that. 
We need to be much more active in those conversations. Sorry, what we've been trying to call engineers, is the engineer tradition not perhaps just surpassed the Egyptian tradition? Engineers don't have original IP. They grab it all from physics and other engineers. I think what distinguishes our potential is starts with an idea, and the idea has a value. And how do you manage value in, 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 in the modern world? Engineers are good critics of people with IP and ideas. And our design the major building in the world, I think, of engineers. Because you let them, for instance. You let them. Mm. You let them. You gave them the whole modernist project on the plate and ran off uh, reintroducing old saying. romantic motifs as postmodern. This is what I'm thinking when I'm saying is that Japanese actually just came to the engineering. Got back and slapped them around. <laughs> 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 so I think Has the uh, discussion given you a clear sense of direction? Or do you feel a little bit more questions. challenged <laughs> because you were before you walked in? You're not supposed to seek praise from the audience. Why right? not? <laughs> it's only interesting more questions for us for the world's consults. I mean, it's interesting and it's something that I think John Cleary and I thought about, but it is also, you know, graduate school I come from, which was a, has a great tradition I think that uh, it's really as fast as that as well. It's a sort of the changing of technology and the way that technology has become more accessible for our parts in terms of production, manufacturing and materials. I think the key may probably lie there for architects who want to innovate. And that's probably where you need to start looking. Because I think we can now control some of these processes and engage with it, whereas in the past we can Maybe that's where the secret lies. One or more of them. In innovation. Yeah, I mean, but innovation and then the scale where architects can access it. You know, and I think we need to put ourselves on that position. Not recreation. So it depends on what the kind of recreation. Let me launch off in another direction now. And that's mm. the sort of nitty gritty of practice. Um, but I obviously it doesn't matter that. From an outsider's perspective who's much embedded in a family of architects, is, 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 is there, has it been, uh, were we right in introducing a reflective profession, uh, philosophers? as helping set an agenda or you shouldn't ask me. I am at least qualified to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean I was wondering when the series started what and it was except for uh, Jonathan, the commentators or the people framing a uh, position were the philosophers. Um, do, do architects, and this is probably in at the end of it, but does, does the agenda in architecture necessarily come from outside? I'm actually thinking of people like Abel Logier, who was a theologian, which made a huge impact on the development of the Enlightenment, Enlightenment and the beginning of the modern project. Uh, Raskin, who was not an architect, an art critic, but he, I certainly set an agenda for the profession for a long time. All romantic arts and crafts, socialist arts and crafts, bringing back the profession to the hand that makes it. Uh, I do not have the vocation to uh, tell anybody how clever philosophers are. Uh, but I uh, would maintain that uh, in the lecture I held here, I insisted that architecture is a secondary practice. Average citizens 
dwell before they consult architects. They decide on what is important before they consult architects. If there is to be something like an agenda, then that agenda for architects can be established only once the relation to citizens from citizens has been established. That means that you have to speak sooner or later about what you call the nitty-gritty. Because if you don't, it doesn't help that you have lofty ideas about uh, looking to nature for, for new materials and practices and so on, but in practice you know that at the end of the month, I mean, you have to take something home and there are people in your office depending on you having a project and so on and so forth. But it doesn't help that you speak about, well, that you speak only about the lofty ideas. You have to speak about them too because you have to have a bigger project, the global, the global picture. But sooner or later, you have to ask yourself, okay, what does this mean for the way in which we teach architecture students? Right? Because we form the opinion. Are we introducing courses in speedy innovation? If that's not perhaps a contradiction in terms, mm -hmm. but slow innovation is not, uh, is not a practical solution. Are we teaching students, for instance, in the very practical ways in which to become politically uh, um, efficient, uh, to become political players, so as to be able to have influences on process by which we decide what are the standards according to which our work will be measured, or the, the regulations imposed on us by the state and so on and so forth. Those are the kind of things that I have in mind why I always tend to think first of all from the perspective of the nitty-gritty. No nitty-gritty, no use for an agenda. I don't know how we're doing with time on your machine. Or an hour twenty to an hour twenty. Mm. So we we must just be about there, are we? Yeah. So we should should we start winding down? Should we start winding down? Okay. Right. Okay. I think we can any anyway, time we can start winding down. Uh, how do we wind down? for teaching and practice of bridging the two and bringing the two together. Um, I think students do see that in a, in a lecturer's approach and his, you know, his passion for teaching, but also, um, yeah, and I think, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, um, but I personally do place a lot of value on that. Um, I think with that, I think we underestimate the value of mentorship, and I think it's, um, I don't have that much experience in terms of architecture and practice yet. I have worked before, but I do believe that mentorship, mentorship is something that lacks um, accountability both ways, both from the student's side and the, the mentor on the practice side. Um, I would love to see in some of the near future that architecture and or, or theory and practice can somehow start to come closer to each other and start influencing one another to some point. Um, but yeah, just I think in terms of students, we really do value a lecture or a theorist um, and his ambition and his approach to really encourage future architects and encourage their um, creativity and you know, their ambition. All right, in summary, because I think we have some more follow-up. What we're following up this with the roof, again, some the people in here will follow up with individual presentations. Yes. Yeah. Very much. Jump here. I think somebody else is in line. So um, in a kind of way, I suppose this is also helps set an agenda for follow-up presentations by the panel members. I wonder if it's been, I hope it's been helpful in that, in directing some sort of thinking and some sort of response. We also thank Aaron 
for making himself available, as we do Jonathan, who bring the discourse that they presented from previous uh, presentation. I'm very happy to have you back again. And uh, yeah, I think it's there's not enough of this, perhaps not enough. There isn't perhaps we don't seem to have the forum for just open discourse uh, in the profession. Everybody seems to be rushing to have other things to do, and uh, generally only in search of CPD points. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Um, it will be go out on uh, YouTube, I presume. Yeah. So those who prefer it in the comfort of their own home or whatever they happen to be will be able to enjoy this uh, by proxy or what's the other word? There? Vicariously. Yeah. So we wish them well as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to the audience for your presence and those who participated. And again, I think if anybody has ideas to share post-reflection, you are welcome to drop an email maybe by a Bergman partners offices if you want to, who will, can also redirect them if you can't get any of the participants directly. But it's uh, no, always interesting to engage in the moment. Thank you for being with us. Right there. Thank you. Good. Thank you.